one. We've got some anonymous wisp here. Yeah, don't ask who. Um, we've been testing the different horns that, that David brought all day. We have uh, our TP-Link asymmetrical 2030. We have the- It's not a TP-Link. It's T a TPA. TP always throws me off. Yeah, uh, TPA. We have we have our RF elements 2030. We have our RF elements symmetrical 30. We have the Isohorn symmetrical 30. We have the RF, uh, I mean, the Isohorns asymmetrical 2030. And we just plugged this one in. So we're seeing it for the first time. And uh, look at that. I, I just want to zoom in here on that. So that's the, that's the station signals. Yep. We got 404 bars and on the rocket prism AC. What are you seeing there? Obviously, we're not gonna be able to really get that into the video because- So I, I, I'm, we've mainly been looking at uplink capacity because we can't really get modulation. On every other horn that we've been playing with, after we've got them tuned in, there is always one station below 200 megs. We don't have a station below 200 megs on this uh, ISO horn. So, and that's the asymmetrical. On the asymmetrical. So, but with the symmetrical, we did have one below 200 megs. Is that correct? Uh, let me see. I got the picture. And I, I'm sorry if y'all are commenting. I, I can't really see the video. Let me, it, it's super bright out here. Super bright. So I'm, I'm squinting just to, just to, I don't know, Four. keep my eyes from burning out. We had four below 200 on the symmetrical 30. From ISO horns. From ISO horns. On the RF element uh, asymmetrical 30, we had one. And then on the symmetrical 30, we had one, two, four again. Four. Yeah. So the symmetricals are not performing as well as the asymmetricals. And the, it's worth noting, we, we just divided this up. So um, there was previously a 90 degree horn. It's down there, you can still see it. So previously there's this 90 degree horn going into that ladder. <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, but now we've got, that's been divided up into this. Into these uh, six 30 degree horns. Yeah, so we, we, we've, we've divided this up. And then we've took this one here in the middle, which had the most stations, is that right? That's right. And then it, we, we, we started by aligning it properly. So when they first divided it up, it wasn't really properly aligned. It was loosely aligned. Um, so we started by aligning that. And then we tested against the RF element symmetrical and the isohorn symmetrical and the isohorns asymmetrical. And I'm actually surprised that the symmetricals did not perform as well as the asymmetrical, but the asymmetricals do have more gain. Um, and with the more gain is also coming more modulation. So, um, which if, you know, if I play with this a little bit, it changes modulation and you have to make sure that you have those tightened down to, to spec to, uh, that's about five foot pounds, you know, it's just, so, and, and by the way, when you just jam the radio up into these twist port adapters, um, you are connecting to RP SMA connectors right there. They're just hidden under the plastic housing. And so you're not uh, properly torquing your connections. And so you're gonna get variability just from that twist port adapter not being properly torqued. And we see that with the actual RP SMA cables, we see that little bumps in the cable when they're not properly torqued will change the signal levels of the connected stations along with the corresponding modulation rates. Let me see if I can find my glasses in a shady area and try to get some feedback here from the audience. So, we have no questions. Well, that's awesome. I'm glad we could solve <laughs> solve the mystery as to asymmetrical versus symmetrical when it comes to um, antenna gain and uh, modulation rates. And we will be posting 
the uh, the the screenshots of the results. Um, what are you on top of? We are on top of an ice rink, and they're doing a wrestling competition down below, um, which I think is uh, kind of fun because it's analogous to uh, what we're doing on top of the roof here as well. So, doing a little bit of a a wrestling match in RF to figure out uh, which antennas perform best in these sorts of settings. So, you know, another thing that I'd really like to point out is that these are our wideband antennas. So these are narrow band. So these were designed from 5.1 to six gigahertz, I think. This one, uh, they, they tested as six gigahertz was coming out. They, they tested it up to, uh, I think 6.7, 6.8, something like that. So it, it can operate on six gigahertz. Uh, these go from 4.9 to 7.2. We might have to market them a little bit differently because uh, when you start uh, advertising that you can, uh, yeah, might be a problem if we're uh, going into license frequency um, with our advertising. So. Um, we'll market them as uh, 5.1 to 7.2, um, but uh, they, uh, they are wideband. Um, they are designed for 6 gigahertz. We first started building these because we noticed that there was no um, 6 gigahertz antennas coming. And I believe if Isohorns didn't show up at WISPA this year, that there's a good chance that uh, our competitor wouldn't want to release six gigahertz product right now because they have a lot of five gigahertz inventory still out there. So nobody's gonna buy five gigahertz specific horns if they all know that six gigahertz is coming and wideband is coming. So if you're an antenna manufacturer with excess five gigahertz inventory um, and six gigahertz comes available, then the logical thing to do would to be to produce a narrow band six gigahertz antenna and wait for the very last minute before releasing that to the general public so that people would continue buying the five gigahertz inventory. But Isohorns came on the scenes with a wide band six gigahertz product and I think somewhat forced the hand of our competitor to release their wide band six gigahertz product before they would have preferred. So I'm still skeptical. You know, I'd love to have the six gigahertz antennas here and, and test them side by side in this setting. Um, but uh, we're working with what we've got, which is five gigahertz. Yeah, it's way better to, uh, so right here, so somebody asked, is it, is, are you saying that it's better to connect with the pigtails than with the twist port adapter? So it's way better to connect to the, the pigtails than to the twist port adapter because the SMA connectors, as per their specification, should be properly torqued. So you torque them to, to one pressure if they're brass and you torque them to a higher pressure if they're stainless. Um, these are, these are um, zinc plated brass and the radio has gold plated um, brass. Um, and underneath this, it's, I'm not sure if you can see this or not, but these are just RP SMA connectors. And so with the twist port adapter, you just take the radio and you jam it up in there and you're gonna have inconsistent connectivity on those RPSMA connectors. Um, with these, you can properly torque them as per their, the RPSMA specification, and you're not gonna get the same variability as if you're just jamming the radio up in there. So you can, I mean, similarly, you can just not torque these, right? So you can, you can just finger tighten them, um, but you'll get variable signal levels. Um, it's going to cause problems. So you should properly torque them. That's the, that's the proper way to use an RP SMA cable, not just have 
it jammed up in uh, the, the twist port adapter. Well, sure. Uh, so Robert says that five, five gigahertz antennas would be discounted to clear space for wideband antennas. Uh, that's already happening. So we're already seeing uh, some, some uh, distributors slashing the prices of antennas, um, trying to get them off their shelves. So uh, there's clearly an inventory problem. I mean, it's, it's not... Uh, that's not proprietary or confidential or secret. You can just go onto the distributors' uh, websites and see their inventory levels. Um, but uh, five gigahertz uh, horn antennas were fantastic. I mean, product of the year, I mean, multiple, multiple, multiple years in a row. And then what happened was a variety of attacks on five gigahertz horn antennas coming from multi-user MIMO, coming from CBRS 3.65, coming from 60 gigahertz, and, and, and coming from cheaper horn antennas where you could, you could pay half the price and get comparable performance, or coming from fiber to the home. So, you know, there's been just an onslaught of attacks coming from a lot of different directions on the on the five gigahertz horn antenna products. And so while, while it may have seemed like a good idea a few years ago to produce a massive amount of five gigahertz horn antennas so that you can get discounts with your factories on volume production, um, it, it just turns out that that's not uh, it wasn't a good idea. So um, while these are, are, are definitely great products, um, I, I think that there's, uh, there, there, there's some underlying problems. And I, I talk about the problems freely um, and, and I get a lot of flack for that. Yeah, so I, so I don't have a six gigahertz license right now. I'd love to do a uh, a six gigahertz comparison. I do have the uh, the forty six hundred from Cambium. Um, I'd have to go install some CPE uh, to actually do that comparison. And I've been traveling since Wispa Palooza, and I want to go home. So I plan to do a six gigahertz side by side comparison with the. Uh, existing products that have had the red stickers that go to say they go to 6.4 or whatever it is that they, they support. So I'd do the, the low end of six gigahertz side by side. Um, but I want to go home. Yeah. So, uh, Robert says I've seen problems when a radio was not all the way plugged into twist port adapters fall out or poor signal because of it yeah yep. so th there's a ton of variability so when you're not torquing these down the other thing that we've seen right right here is your two retention clips and some less gentle techs let's say uh when they're taking out uh one can can break and wear that down and so that will loosen it up mm -hmm. it's the only thing retaining it is and on the back of here like on this rocket prism is you have these metal tabs on the back so the only thing holding this in is these two taps right here. Right. And so as those get worn out if, right. you know, through through repeated insertion, that makes this less reliable. And you're probably not going to see that so much on the AP side, but you might see that more on the client side. Um, and, uh, you know, RPSMAs also have a, a lifespan, something like 600 uh, connections. So you can only swap out a radio 600 times before you should probably swap out the RPSMA connectors. Let's see. I'm, uh, I'm scrolling through the comments. Now, uh, so using a symmetrical 30 degree horn won't necessarily give you better range than a asymmetrical 30 degree horn, 
the main benefit you get out of an asymmetrical 30 degree is you get higher gain. Right. And so you can get better receive signals further away. But the main thing you still want to look at is is your signal and your modulation rate. On 5 gigahertz AC, you want to see negative 62 or better, 25 SNR or better to be able to get ADX modulation reliably. Well, and so another thing here is I, I wasn't sure. Um, I, I was just legitimately curious. Everybody was was uh, was giving me ulterior motives to, to wanting to find out if the symmetrical um, was indeed worse than the asymmetrical. I've seen a lot of comments in the WISP groups about using asymmetricals rather than symmetricals. And so one idea is that you want to um, you want to uh, block out noise. So um, and so one WISP recommended um, doing the 30 degree asymmetrical but actually having a 20 degree beam. Um, so that way you get the higher gain, um, but then you also get more noise isolation on the sides. So if you have a tight pocket of subscribers off in the distance, that you're, you're really concentrating on those subscribers and blocking off the noise at the edges. And, but the, the thing is, is that when you squeeze that beam, you, you introduce side lobes. And so then to what extent do does that. that do the side lobes uh, affect the noise uh, blocking. And so that's what that's what I wanted to test is. So I, I, I knew that we were gonna get some more gain. Um, I, I was curious about the noise levels and we didn't look at the noise levels on those screenshots. I hope we had the noise uh, column selected, um, but we will look at the noise. Um, we'll post the screenshots and we'll, we'll show the noise. So, and, and so, the, the common wisdom of using the asymmetrical because it's higher gain seems to be correct. It seems like the asymmetrical does in fact outperform the 30 degree symmetrical when you've got a tight pocket of subscribers. And what we're looking at, I'm gonna come around here, we're looking at that subdivision up on the hill. So that's the new subdivision without the trees. So you can see it's fall here, it's autumn. And so are these cottonwoods? What are these? You have some oak, some aspen, some cottonwood, some uh, pines, uh, a right. bunch of it out there. <laughs> so, so we got a, a variety of deciduous trees. And uh, in the new neighborhood, it looks like they bulldozed them all or they never planted them. And so, so starting about, so let's see, that's zero. So starting about, so nine, starting about 45 degrees, going to about 90 degrees. That's the pocket we're looking at because there's three new neighborhoods that they built up there. Right. And, and the one that we were focusing on is that middle section right there. So we're, we're focused on this middle neighborhood up on the foothills. Um, and we're outside in, in Logan, Utah. So um, anyway, it, 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 we, there is a, I doubt that we have an even spread of our subscribers. So it would certainly be interesting if we had a, a, a 30 degree spread of our subscribers, of our wireless stations. but. Um, certainly, it, it appears to be true that when you have a, a, a pocket of subscribers clustered, clustered together, the asymmetrical horn outperforms the 30 degree symmetrical. Horn. So we have we have another one right there, uh, located in Cyprus, and there's an issue with co-locating because of GPS. The only thing I can say for that is is try make sure that your your radios. So you have if you look at your H plots. You can see your beam, and you see that there's a drop off at a certain. I'm gonna, aspect. I'm gonna step back so okay. you can use your hands. So, so you have. Let me, let me put this down. So let's take this one for example. There's no plants on this one yet, so I'm not gonna disconnect them by being in front of it. So this one has a 30 degree beam, right? And it comes off. If you look at your H plot, then you'll see that there is um, your your low, right? And then it drops off. So right here is your perfect signal. That's your 30. As you move. 10 degrees off, 20 degrees off, 30 degrees off, 40, 50, 90, you start to drop off. And that's how you co-locate, is you make sure that the horns are moved to where they're not gonna interfere with the beam. And then you can do A, B, A, B channel planning as long as you have an even amount of horns. If you no longer have GPS coordination, then they're not gonna sync. They're not gonna send and receive at the same time. 
one way around this is the is the old school way of put isolating material between your antennas so that when it does have incoming when it's receiving and sending and there's bleed on the back it's not bleeding to your other radios right okay other questions so it, it's just it's a real simple mount plate so this one's not even attached um, so you would you would just put a hose clamp um, between the radio and the mount plate Eh, focus in on the the horns. Can't comment on that, Robert. <laughs> All right. Um, Y'all have a great day. It's a beautiful one. This is uh this is Logan, Utah. Thanks for tuning in.